every challenge can become a golden hour. And to do that, you need the growth goal that you're aiming for. That is the foundation of your strategy. The rest of the strategy is just coming up with some concrete steps that will get you traction in it. When we say a challenge is there to be worked, we mean it's there to be strategized so that you can actively think of, put your intelligence into aiming higher while you do it and then make concrete steps to carry it out. Before we get started, if you enjoy these episodes, you might want to check out more at OptimWork.com. Our website offers unique content, tools, and exercises to help you thrive at work and beyond. We have an in-depth masterclass covering our entire theory of growth, daily recommendations for personalized advice, and a platform to help groups and organizations learn and practice optimal work together. You can get a free trial at OptimWork.com. Now let's start the episode. Hey, this is Sharif here with another episode of the OptimWork podcast, joined by Dr. Kevin Majors. Kevin, great to be back here with you again. Yeah, Sharif, great to be back. Yeah, Kevin, well, uh, you've been filming the anxiety class, which is great, so it should be coming out pretty soon now. Uh, and one of the things that you told me recently was that kind of at the heart of everything you've come to realize in a deeper way is the idea of growth goals. Uh, so I, I like to talk about that. And especially someone recently asked also about the reframer on optimwork.com. And because it asks a series of questions to help people reframe a challenge that they're facing. And in some ways, maybe mm -hmm. you would say helps them to set a growth goal uh, in the face of it. Um, and they were asking, hey, can you kind of help us understand the why behind each step or what each step is doing? So can you do a podcast episode on that? So I thought maybe we could kind of combine these two ideas of growth goals and mm -hmm. then going in depth into the reframer tool on optimwork.com, which is very powerful. Yeah, that sounds great, Sharif. It was for me a, a big discovery to go, to be doing a deeper dive into the neuroscience and reading things, making sure that the approach that we're showing on OptimWork is really the most up-to-date. And I'm totally convinced that that it is. And one of the things that was clear to me is when we sit down to do a task, it's very easy for us to do things that we've done before the same way that we did them before. So we do them kind of rotely. And that roteness is something to be kind of admired and, and try to understand it more. Because roteness is the, it's the, it's essentially the primacy of predictions in our behavior. Because when you're doing something rotely, it's that your brain has predicted how you would do it, and then you just go along that. And that has a great benefit, which is that it makes things so much easier to do. So it frees up space for us to be thinking and doing other things and multitasking and all this. So you can kind of sense that while there are good elements to it, and we, we in fact, we must have it. There is a danger too, though, right? That, some, that when, what happens then when life becomes rote? when our job becomes rote or our dealings with people like in our family becomes rote, that's the real danger. And, and that, so what I came to see is that the, there's one way out of it. And then that's that you have to treat the next instance of doing something as being different than the previous ones. And the magical word I discovered is unique. So unique, just using that word in your mind, gives you permission to let go of all of the predictions about how you'd normally do something. So, and you, and you start to ask yourself, like, that's why the first question in the reframer is, how is this giving me a unique opportunity to grow? And so I think that is where I would want to say, that was the, in some sense, it just brought it, again, really strongly home to me. That that's so essential to what we do in optimal work. Can you get, can we work with an example a little bit just to understand what's going on here? Because a, a lot of these books, you know, that you read on habits, like atomic habits, you know, they say, Hey, it's really good for you to just get into this pattern where your brain has learned exactly how to do things. Like they give the example, maybe of brushing your teeth. Like once you figure out how to brush your teeth or tie your shoes, you don't want to have to think about it again. It's great that your brain just somehow has this action 
code it up. And as soon as you want to tie your shoes, boom, they're tied and you didn't have to think too much about it. Um, so are mm. you suggesting that every time we tie our shoes, we should always be thinking of how can I make this a unique shoe tying event that I want to do it in a different way every single time? Or, or you wouldn't apply it to kind of a trivial example like that? I think if a person has a strong enough connection to ideals that they could actually aim for the ideal while tying their shoes, that person would be truly great. So I think that, that would take a greatness of heart to be able to go down to the smallest actions like that and to bring some ideal into them. And ultimately, only the very highest ideals can be applied to the even the smallest actions. I mean, some ideals like punctuality, this is just not going to apply at all. <laughs> so, and then others, but, you know, but my guess is that if someone was really loving, they could find a way to do it lovingly. That's great. Okay. That's, that's great. So then uh, what about in a more, um, maybe just if you could help us understand in a more maybe complicated task, something that's related to work, say, you know, write, writing an email or something, I, I guess there's a value in being able to just kind of churn out emails more quickly. Cause it's just mm -hmm. automatic, you know, exactly how to respond to all these different cases. Um, so that's where it's be become habitual. Um, but yeah. you're saying that's not the ideal to strive for. There's something beyond that. Maybe the, another example, just to throw out, there would be a cashier in a store. So that it's, if, um, let's say the cashier was trying to be really w ordered in how they were going through putting things in a certain order and putting things into the bag. Let's say it's a grocery store. And so they're, they're putting things into the bag as well for you. Well, okay. That would be, um, you know, you could see them being able to live order in some way. Um, but even then, you, you would expect that that could become rote very easily. So there has to be some way that this is a unique opportunity for them. And I think that probably the number one way would be to really connect to the people. Because the people are unique. And so for, for, I think for all of us, it's our interactions with actually living people that does give something unique. To, to every moment so that you can have a unique attentiveness, thoughtfulness, consideration, appreciation, interest, engagement, generosity. You know, there's it just like the list goes on and on. So you can, you can develop ways of treating the people that you're dealing with as being unique. Yeah. Okay. But even if the work, did, what didn't involve other people, I think there's still a way that it's, it's a little more like tying the shoes. But it, and it would be a more, let's say, heroic form of practice that, I don't know, maybe you just have to stamp forms and there's no people. It's just you have to read something and stamp it, put it in the next pile, read, stamp, next pile. I think it would take um, some kind of deeper greatness of spirit. But for instance, what if one was aiming to develop a skill of um, inner, inner silence? Yeah, you know, and they just very mindfully took up the form, and they were, and then they did that, and they just were aiming to maintain a sense of peace on the inside, of tranquil. Like there's just this inner tranquility that they're going to keep. They're going to stay mindful of their heart and the movements of what their heart is doing, and they're going to like when thoughts come up, they're going to let go and re-anchor themselves. They could turn it into at least mindfulness. So I think that there is. I think mindfulness. I think is a skill, not an ideal, but. Uh, but perhaps there are other ways they could even learn to bring higher ideals of love into it. Um, is there someone they're serving by doing it? Is there someone they could imitate? Someone that someone that they admire that they could try to imitate by doing it well? There's a lot of ways that you can find to bring ideals into it. But the key would be for the person to see this as a unique opportunity rather than same old, same old. I think the word unique puts predictions on hold. You give yourself permission to have no predictions for a task. And so it's really powerful at times to think of, you know, think of your next dinner with family. How could that be a unique opportunity? Right. And then you could ask more examples like, well, could I surprise them with some quality? That also gives you permission then to do something different than the way you normally do it. Um, okay, Kevin, can you help me understand a little bit the balance that a person should have in their lives between 
One is what I think maybe I could characterize what you're saying this way is like challenging yourself in how you do something to do it in a new and better way to bring an ideal into it. But you're still doing the same thing versus challenging yourself by taking on, you know, new thing, new challenges. So, um, you know, I can think of someone, you know, writing over the course of their school career. Maybe they start in third grade writing something very simple, like a one paragraph short story. And then if, if, if they were still writing that, you know, in high school and then in college, it was still, okay, write a one paragraph short story. And they were just challenging themselves by, in how they did it and putting a, a, a high, you know, striving for a higher ideal. They might, feel like, okay, this is getting road or they're plateauing, but often they'll take on more, you know, a longer short story or now poetry or an essay or, you know, so this, Mm -hmm. so I think you can challenge yourself by trying to do new things versus trying to do the same things in new ways. So how should we think about those two dimensions? How do they relate? Well, I think that creativity, flexibility, uh, vision, these, these are all the ability to have a deeper vision you know, the ability to model yourself after people who are better at something than, than you are, there are always avenues of growth that we will embark on when we try to grow in how we do something. There's always going to be some way that it develops and deepens so that there's a kind of expertise. I think expertise is a great word. You know, and, and people, you can develop expertise. I think the highest kind of expertise, or, or you could say mastery, is self mastery and ideals are the example of that. And so, and the bonds we have in our life, well, that's what gives meaning to self mastery. But even then you develop self mastery by develop, by exercising lesser forms of mastery that are skills. So you in fact, wouldn't be able to be creative in how you go about writing if you didn't do some kind of developing of other skills in writing to write short stories, as you were saying, to write, uh, praises of other pieces to you know to to be writing reviews to be writing all, whatever it is, you would you would probably be wanting to develop your skills in new ways, and that's going to require some kind of doing different kinds of things. Uh, if you're, I, I don't know if I could think of a job. I mean, maybe there are some jobs that are so defined that you like the person, you know, like say a cashier where in fact there's not much new that they can do you know and they can and maybe they can only improve how they do things so much and then they have to go to why they're doing it so it's like the what you do is the lower hanging fruit the how is the re- what what shapes that more and more but really that has to come from the why okay what's what's the ultimate reason why you're doing it and in some ways that reflects skills ideals bonds that kind of what how why Before we continue, a brief message. If you're benefiting from these discussions, please take a moment to hit like and subscribe. Doing so helps us to reach more people. So you're not just learning, you're also helping others to discover a path of growth and flourishing. Thanks for your support. Okay, Kevin, this is all this on growth goals is great. And I think this is really helping set the stage for what we're doing here with the reframer tool on the website. Uh, So people can find that on the site under tools reframer and it's a short exercise it takes maybe seven to ten minutes well there's a free writing part at the end and you can set your own time for Mm -hmm. that so it's a little bit variable Um, but the idea here is to help you take a challenge that you're facing and that you might be seeing as a threat and help you to flip it to see it as an opportunity Um, and maybe one way of putting it also is just to help you set a growth goal as as you're facing that challenge so maybe we could start here just to out by outlining the steps that you'll go through on the reframer. And then Kevin, Mm -hmm. you can give a sense of the big picture here of what's going on. And then we can go more in detail into each of the steps to, to show, you know, how better, how to do it better. Um, and and what it's doing. Uh, so the, the, it proceeds in a couple in about five steps. So the first is to get down to the essence of the challenge. What is the challenge you're facing and looking at it from the perspective of situation, thought and feeling so that you can first clearly define, okay, what do you find so challenging here? What's what's the, the essence of it? Um, and then the second is to identify, are you actively engaging the challenge or passively 
being challenged. And I suppose here the uh, the assumption is that if you're seeing the challenge as a threat, you're probably being a little bit passive in the face of the challenge. So just to help in uh, reflect on you know why that's the case and how you can be more active in engaging it. Um, yes, yeah, really asking: Are people feeling overwhelmed? Yeah. Do they feel? Are they feeling daunted? So, because that all happens then when you're kind of being challenged by life, rather than grabbing the bull by the horns and actively challenging yourself in it. Yeah. Um, and then now we get to starting to flip, where the next step is asking, okay, how can you grow in the face of the challenge? So this is starting now to get into the reframe. How can you grow? What's how can you grow the most? How can you see this challenge as an opportunity for growth? Um, mm. And then uh, helping people see how can this growth enable you to love and serve others, in either in this challenge or in other challenges that you might or in other challenges that you might face in life. How is this challenge going to help you grow in an ideal that will make you basically you know a better person that you can better serve others? Uh, and then the last yeah. step is okay. Now, how can you be grateful for this task? So um, that's or for this challenge. Um, and then we give a, yeah. a free writing exercise for people to take a different prompt. You know, we have a, a bunch of different prompts to choose from and to reflect more deeply on that. So it's, it's an interesting path, Kevin. I wonder if you could comment on this of getting yeah. people from okay, starting to identify the challenge all the way up to. How can I be grateful for this challenge? So why is gratitude like the height of reframing for you? I think it means that it's become thoroughly good. In order, this goes back to the very opening lines of the Nicomachean Ethics, where Aristotle says that in every action, we are aiming for some good, to attain some good. So you can only embrace a challenge to the extent that the challenge seems good to you. And it's good, perhaps not in its details, but in its goal, the goal that it's giving you. So you can find any challenge to be appealing if you can find the right goal to aim for by, and the growth to attain by means of the challenge. So you have to look at a way that transcends this particular challenge. And then that allows you, once you've done that, to say, now, in fact, I see this whole challenge as good. Difficult, yes, perhaps painful. Um, some elements, you know, might be very hard. But now you can see how, in fact, this is something uh, that, in, that is good for you. In fact, one of the free writing things we have at the end is, says, um, imagine your future self telling you why you eventually became grateful for this challenge. Use your imagination to list out the ways that you tell yourself that you could have grown in this. Uh, but we, people have to be careful with gratitude, um, that they don't try to jump to gratitude before they've done the work of reframing. Gratitude is more like a check. It's more like once you see you're capable of gratitude, the reframe is secure. But you can't force the reframe by saying, oh, I'm so grateful that Aunt Ida is coming to dinner tonight, even though you you dread on Ida, you know, to use the classic example. So you can't, so people sometimes think of reframing as saying in their mind, oh, I'm so grateful for this. But that, of course, becomes rote. And then that isn't capable of transcending your negative predictions. So, so the, just also just to, re, to go back to the, um, like the very beginning, it's really important that people try to put their finger on what about this is the real challenge. You know, and you know, as, you're, as you're going through, is it is it the situation itself, or is it the thoughts I'm going to have, or is it the feelings I'm going to have? But what makes this so hard? That already gives you a new way of addressing and working with something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and okay, I think that's a great place to start to dig in in more detail in each of these steps. So, with the the first one, helping people to identify the essence of the challenge. Uh, my sense is that. Initially, people will think that the challenge is something external, you know, a difficult task or a person that they find uh, annoying or whatever it is. Uh, but that what we're trying to help people do is to flip the challenge to see it as something internal, mm -hmm. uh, you know, some as element of themselves. Like, oh, the reason why I find I can't deal with this person and they're I find them annoying is because actually I am 
impatient or I am prone to like, you know, thinking uncharitably about other people. So that's actually the challenge. Am I right in is are we trying to get people to flip from external to internal? I think that that always is part of it because every ideal is a form of self mastery. So you have to ask yourself, what in myself do I have to attain mastery over? And the ideals are what allow us to do that. But at the same time, the there there's there's um I think that we we still want to be able to do it for motives that transcend ourselves. So eventually we want to see even the growth that we attain in ideals as being in the service of others, that in fact it's about love and service. So I think, that in, so yes, it's not just about self-perfection, yeah. So sh if someone at this point they have, oh, my challenge is, well, this presentation, you know, is real, is, or th this task is really hard and I just don't want to do it because it seems annoying or boring. Is that a good challenge for them to be facing or do like, is it, can they stop? Can they move on to the next step? The challenge is this task that I don't want to do. That's good enough to move on. You could ask yourself then, <clears throat> as you're thinking of the ways you could grow, it could be your ability to break things down into smaller steps. It could be your ability to learn from the example and the advice of others. Uh, so is it, is it really about you learning how to have a greater patience in the face of frustration? Uh, is there perseverance here? And if you're more persevering and doing what you need to do, will that help you to love and serve others? So the nice thing about every kind of skills will always connect to ideals and ideals will always connect to bonds in the end that in some way, our own growth and self-mastery, our growth in every ideal, um, the highest ideals are all synonyms of being loving, you know, being caring and kind and generous. And, you know, all of these are like ways essentially of living love as the ideal of all ideals. So love unites ideals. Um, I think that there's also a sense here that when we challenge ourselves from motives of love, it's the precise opposite of challenging ourselves from motives of fear. And typically, any motive to just get something done or to get something over with is still dominated by fear. So we're going to tend to do things more automatically and rotely and efficiently to get through it as quickly as we can. And that is what we're always, I think, needing to like learn to identify when that happens, to see that, no, that's all based on fear. But what if instead of fearing this challenge, it was somehow in the service of love? So in the service of the deepest kind of growth I can attain, then what's the best way I could be loving while doing this? What's the best mode of service that I can have? Sometimes just, you know, with, with students, it can be a little harder because their, their work is a little bit more removed from the direct service of others. But they could also think, if I really mastered this material, could I better help my friends to master it? Could I be a better source of, of advice for, for those that I'm working with? How would I master this stuff so well that I could actually teach a class on it? So to start thinking about how you would be teaching these things. There's, but there's always a way that you can bring in, in some way, the higher motives. I think that's getting to the step three of... Um seeing how you can grow the most, and then a little bit of step four of how can that make you better able to love and serve others. So that's great. That's super helpful in understanding those steps. I also want to get into the the step in between, and I think this is basically our, our last question here, but mm -hmm. um, because it ties in this idea of active challenge and work. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, th I think for you, you, you see that every challenge is kind of there to be worked on. Uh, yeah. that, you know, it's not this, the reframer is not necessarily people, people aren't necessarily going to do it for a work related challenge. It could be a personal challenge, it can, but in any case, you want to help people have the sense of working the challenge, breaking it down into steps, thinking of a new way of approaching it. Turn it into a golden hour. You, every challenge can become a golden hour. And to do that, you need the growth goal that you're aiming for. 
that is the foundation of your strategy. The rest of the strategy is just coming up with some concrete steps that will get you traction in it. So when we say a challenge is there to be worked, we mean it's there to be strategized. It's there to, so that you can actively think of, put your intelligence into aiming higher while you do it, and then make concrete steps to carry it out. That is the best way that you can set up any challenge. And really any task, if you start to think about it in terms of like set a high goal that your heart can resonate with, that you can, have, can feel a bit enthused about attaining, and then lay out concrete steps, that work is just now ready that when you have a free moment, when you have the available time, now you can do a real golden hour on that. So the growth goal is the foundation of everything. You, know, you have to begin with the end in mind. Yeah. So, okay, great. Actually, I do, do have one last question about how the reframer mm -hmm. works. Um, so mm -hmm. if we've taken people through all these steps and they've gotten to the point where now they can be grateful for it. So it's like, okay, they define, mm -hmm. define the essence of the challenge. Yep. They uh, identified the reframe and then they saw how to be grateful for it. Why is free writing also important? Because we then give people a set of prompts to choose from to free write for about mm -hmm. five minutes of, you gave an example, your future yeah. self looking back, giving you reasons to be grateful. Why is it important to, even if, if maybe they've already done all the reframing, to now do free writing? How does that help? Free writing is a way of getting, this is, this is the theory of free writing. It allows your right hemisphere, which is the, where you see and resonate with ideals, when you're thinking of growth, when you're thinking of unique, doing things in a new way, that's entirely right-brained. But the left brain is what normally controls language. And so when you, that's why the thoughts in your head tend to be, these are all just predictions coming out. So they tend to have a fixed mentality about what you can do, and they tend to have an automatically negative view of challenge. Well, what free writing tries to do is, and what you, when you're writing, you can actually tell that you're censoring yourself, and that's a left brain thing. Free writing is trying to get past the censor. Just to get you writing in a new way, in a way, getting your left brain to come into total kind of um, submission to the right brain so that, uh, so that it completely now is getting on board with the vision that you've had so that, and, but there can be a lot of friction in that and a lot of self-censoring as that takes place. But this is the idea of that the, the left brain will have its highest use when it serves the ends of the right brain. Because the end of the left brain is getting something done, uh, which is great as long as that's serving higher motives, higher ideals. The growth goal is that. So it's kind of the, that's what you're tr truly trying to get the left brain to serve. So yeah, so it's just a way of getting people to solidify these insights, getting their left brain completely on, on you know, in line, I guess you should, on board, yeah. <laughs> in line and on board, that's right. Yeah, that's great. Um, wonderful, Kevin. Well, I, I think I'll just close with a quick note. You know, I would encourage people to go to optimwork.com and use the reframer for yourself. And you can, you know, use it every day. You can use it in the morning and just say, okay, what's yeah. my biggest challenge today? And to deliberately reframe it. Or if you're facing a new challenge that you find particularly daunting, to fire it up there. Uh, but I think there are different ways and situations that you can you can use it. So thanks so much, Kevin, for Great. explaining the why behind it. Oh, thank you, Sharif. All right. Until next time. Yeah, we'll be back next week. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. If you enjoyed our conversation and you're looking for more in-depth guidance, check out OptimWork.com, our unique platform that delivers content, tools, and exercises to help you thrive at work and beyond.